Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so dies, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked room so? today, didn't you? you tried to How get do the dead come back, Mother? Didn't you? You What's the secret? W.S. by L.P. Hartley The first postcard came from Forfa. I thought you might like a picture of Forfa, it said. You have always been so interested in Scotland, and that is one reason why I am interested in you. I have enjoyed all your books, but do you really get to grips with people? I doubt it. Try to think of this as a handshake from your devoted admirer, W.S. Like other novelists, Walter Streeter was used to getting communications from strangers. Usually they were friendly, but sometimes they were critical. In either case, he always answered them, for he was conscientious. But answering them took up the time and energy he needed for his writing, so that he was rather relieved that W.S. had given no address. The photograph of Forfa was uninteresting. He tore it up. His anonymous correspondent's criticism, however, lingered in his mind. Did he really fail to come to grips with his characters? Perhaps he did. He was aware that in most cases, they were either projections of his own personality, or, in different forms, the antithesis of it. The me and the not me. Perhaps W.S. had spotted this. Not for the first time. Walter made a vow to be more objective. About ten days later arrived another postcard, this time Berwick-upon-Tweed. What do you think of Berwick-upon-Tweed, it said. Like you, it's on the border. I hope this doesn't sound rude. I don't mean that you are a borderline case. You know how much I admire your stories. Some people call them otherworldly. I think you should plump for one world or the other. Another firm handshake. W.S. Walter Streeter pondered over this and began to wonder about the sender. Was his correspondent a man or a woman? It looked like a man's handwriting. Commercial, unselfconscious, and the criticism was like a man's. On the other hand, it was like a woman to probe to want to make him feel at the same time flat and unsure of himself. He felt the faint stirrings of curiosity, but soon dismissed them. He was not a man to experiment with acquaintances. Still, it was odd to think of this unknown person speculating about him, sizing him up. Otherworldly indeed. He reread the last two chapters he had written. Perhaps they didn't have their feet firm on the ground. Perhaps he was too ready to escape, as other novelists were nowadays, into an ambiguous world. A world where the conscious mind didn't have things too much of its own way. But did that matter? He threw the picture of Beric upon Tweed into his November fire and tried to write. But the words came haltingly, as though contending with an extra strong barrier of self-criticism, and as the days passed, he became uncomfortably aware of self-division, as though someone had taken hold of his personality and was pulling it apart. His work was no longer homogeneous. There were two strains in it, unreconciled and opposing, and it went much slower as he tried to resolve the discord. And never mind, he thought. Perhaps I was getting into a groove. These difficulties may be a growing pain. I may have tapped a new source of supply. If only I could correlate the two and make their conflict fruitful, as many artists have. The third postcard showed a picture of York Minster. I know you're interested in cathedrals, it said. I'm sure this isn't a sign of megalomania in your case. But smaller churches are sometimes more rewarding. I'm seeing a good many churches on my way south. Are you busy writing? 
or are you looking round for ideas? Another hearty handshake from your friend, W.S. It was true that Walter Streeter was interested in cathedrals. Lincoln Cathedral had been the subject of one of his youthful fantasies, and he had written about it in a travel book. And it was also true that he admired mere size and was inclined to undervalue parish churches. But how could W.S. have known that? And was it really a sign of megalomania? And who was W.S. anyhow? For the first time it struck him that the initials were his own. No, not for the first time. He had noticed it before, but there were such commonplace initials. There were Gilberts, there were Morms, there were Shakespeare's, a common possession. Anyone might have them. Yet now it seemed to him an odd coincidence, and the idea came into his mind I suppose I have been writing postcards to myself. People did such things, especially people with split personalities. Not that he was one, of course. And yet, there were these unexplained developments, the cleavage in his writing, which had now extended from his thought to his style, making one paragraph languorous with semicolons and subordinate clauses, and another sharp and incisive with main verbs and full stops. He looked at the handwriting again. It had seemed a perfection of ordinariness, anybody's hand, so ordinary as perhaps to be disguised. Now he fancied he saw in it resemblances to his own. He was just going to pitch the postcard into the fire when suddenly he decided not to. I'll show it to somebody, he thought. His friend said, My dear fellow, it's all quite plain. The woman's a lunatic. I'm sure it's a woman. She has probably fallen in love with you and wants to make you interested in her. I should pay no attention whatsoever. People whose names are mentioned in the papers are always getting letters from lunatics. If they worry you, destroy them without reading them. That sort of person is often a little psychic. And if she senses that she's getting a rise out of you, she'll go on. For a moment, Walter Street felt reassured. A woman, a little mouse-like creature, who had somehow taken a fancy to him. And what was there to feel uneasy about in that? It was really rather sweet and touching. And he began to think of her and wonder what she looked like. What did it matter if she were a little mad? Then, his subconscious mind, searching for something to torment him with and assuming the authority of logic, said, Supposing those postcards are a lunatics and you are writing them to yourself, doesn't it follow that you must be a lunatic too? He tried to put the thought away from him. He tried to destroy the postcard as he had the others, but something in him wanted to preserve it. It had become a piece of him, he felt. Yielding to an irresistible compulsion which he dreaded, he found himself putting it behind the clock, on the chimney piece. He couldn't see it, but he knew it was there. He now had to admit to himself that the postcard business had become a leading factor in his life, It had created a new area of thoughts and feelings, and they were most unhelpful. His being was strung up in expectation of the next postcard. Yet when it came, it took him, as the others had, completely by surprise. He couldn't bring himself to look at the picture. I hope you're well, and would like to have a postcard from Coventry, he read. Have you ever been to Coventry? I have, in fact, you sent me there. It isn't a pleasant experience, I can tell you. I'm getting nearer. Perhaps we shall come to grips after all. I advised you to come to grips with your characters, didn't I? Have I given you any new ideas? If I have, you ought to thank me. 
for they are what novelists want, I understand. I have been rereading your novels, living in them, I might say. Another hard handshake, as always, W.S. A wave of panic surged up in Walter Streeter. How was it that he had never noticed all this time the most significant fact about the postcards, that each one came from a place geographically closer to him than the last? I am coming nearer. Had his mind unconsciously self-protective worn blinkers, if it had, he wished he could put them back on. He took an atlas and idly traced out W.S.'s itinerary. An interval of 80 miles or so seemed to separate the stopping places. Walter lived in a large west country town about 90 miles from Coventry. Should he show the postcards to an alienist? But what could an alienist tell him? He would not know what Walter wanted to know, whether he had anything to fear from W.S. Better go to the police. The police were used to dealing with poison pens. If they laughed at him, so much the better. They did not laugh, however. They said they thought the postcards were a hoax and that W.S. would never show up in the flesh. Then they asked if there was anyone who had a grudge against him. No one that I know of, Walter said. They too took the view that the writer was probably a woman. They told him not to worry, but to let them know if further postcards came. A little comforted, Walter went home. The talk with the police had done him good. He thought it over. It was quite true what he had told them, that he had no enemies. He was not a man of strong personal feelings. Such feelings as he had went into his books. In his books he had drawn some pretty nasty characters. Not of recent years, however. Of recent years he had felt a reluctance to draw a very bad man or woman. He thought it morally irresponsible and artistically unconvincing too. There was good in everyone. Yargos were a myth, latterly. But he had to admit it was several weeks since he'd laid pen to paper. So much of this ridiculous business of the postcards weighed upon his mind. If he had to draw a really wicked person, he represented him as a communist or a Nazi, someone who had deliberately put off his human characteristics. But in the past, when he was younger and more inclined to see things as black or white, he had let himself go once or twice. He didn't remember his old books very well, but there was a character in one, the outcast, into whom he had really got his knife. He had written about him with extreme vindictiveness, just as if he were a real person whom he was trying to show up. He had experienced a curious pleasure in attributing every kind of wickedness to this man. He never gave him the benefit of the doubt. He had never felt a twinge of pity for him, even when he paid the penalty for his misdeeds on the gallows. He had so worked himself up that the idea of this dark creature creeping about brimful of malevolence had almost frightened him. Odd that he couldn't remember the man's name. He took the book down from the shelf and turned the pages. Even now they affected him uncomfortably. Yes, here it was. William. William. He would have to look back to find the surname. William. Stainsforth. His own initials. Walter didn't think that the coincidence meant anything, but it coloured his mind and weakened its resistance to his obsession. So uneasy was he that when the next postcard came, it came as a relief. I'm quite close now, he read and involuntarily he turned the postcard over. The glorious central tower of Gloucester Cathedral met his eye. He stared at it, as if it could tell him something. Then, with an effort, went on reading. My movements, as you may have guessed, are not quite under my control. But all being well, I look forward to seeing you. Sometime this weekend. Then. We can really come to grips. 
I wonder if you'll recognise me. It won't be the first time you've given me hospitality. My hand feels a bit cold tonight. But my handshake will be just as hearty. As always, W.S. P.S. Does Gloucester remind you of anything? Gloucester Jail? Walter took the postcard straight to the police station and asked if he could have police protection over the weekend. The officer in charge smiled at him and said he was quite sure it was a hoax, but he would tell someone to keep an eye on the premises. You still have no idea who it could be, he asked. Walter shook his head. It was Tuesday. Walter Streeter had plenty of time to think about the weekend. At first, he felt he would not be able to live through the interval. But strange to say, his confidence increased rather than waning. He set himself to work as though he could work, and presently he found he could, differently from before. And he thought, better. It was as though the nervous strain he had been living under had, like an acid, dissolved a layer of non-conductive thought that came between him and his subject. He was nearer to it now, and his characters, instead of obeying woodenly his stage directions, responded wholeheartedly and with all their beings to the tests he put them to. So passed the days and the dawn of Friday seemed like any other day, until something jerked him out of his self-induced trance, and suddenly he asked himself, oh, when does a weekend begin? A long weekend begins on a Friday. At that, his panic returned. He went to the street door and looked out. It was a suburban, unfrequented street of detached Regency houses like his own. They had tall square gate posts, some crowned with semicircular iron brackets holding lanterns. Most of these were out of repair. Only two or three were ever lit. A car went slowly down the street. Some people crossed it. Everything was normal. Several times that day he went to look and saw nothing unusual, and when Saturday came, bringing no postcard, his panic had almost subsided. He nearly rang up the police station to tell them not to bother to send anyone after all. They were as good as their word. They did send someone. Between tea and dinner, the time when weekend guests most commonly arrive, Walter went to the door and there, between two unlit gate posts, he saw a policeman standing. The first policeman he'd ever seen in Charlotte Street. At the sight and at the relief it brought him, he realised how anxious he'd been. Now he felt safer than he had ever felt in his life, and also a little ashamed at having given extra trouble to a hard-worked body of men. Should he go and speak to his unknown guardian, offer him a cup of tea or a drink? It would be nice to hear him laugh at Walter's fancies, but no, somehow he felt his security the greater when the source was impersonal and anonymous. P.C. Smith was somehow less impressive than police protection. Several times, from an upper window, he didn't like to open the door and stare. He made sure that his guardian was still there, and once, for added proof, he asked his housekeeper to verify the strange phenomenon. Disappointingly, she came back saying she'd seen no policeman. But she was not very good at seeing things. The man must walk about, of course. Perhaps he'd been taking a stroll when Mrs. Kendall looked. It was contrary to his routine to work after dinner, but tonight he did. He felt so much in the vein. Indeed, a sort of exultation possessed him. The words ran off his pen. It would be foolish to check the creative impulse for the sake of a little extra sleep. On, on. They were right who said the small hours were the time to work. When his housekeeper came in to say good night, he scarcely raised his eyes. In the warm, snug little room, the silence purred around him like a kettle. He didn't even hear the doorbell till it had been ringing for some time. A visitor at, at this hour. His knees trembling, he went to the door, scarcely knowing what he expected to find. 
So what was his relief on opening it to see the doorway filled by the tall figure of a policeman? Without waiting for the man to speak, Come in, come in, my dear fellow, he exclaimed. He held his hand out, but the policeman didn't take it. You must have been very cold standing out there. I didn't know it was snowing, though, he added, seeing the snowflakes on the policeman's cape and helmet. Come in and warm yourself. Thanks, said the policeman. I don't mind if I do. Walter knew enough of the phrases used by men of the policeman's stamp not to take this for a grudging acceptance. This way, he prattled on, I was writing in my study. By Jove, it is cold. I'll turn the gas on more. Now, won't you take your traps off and make yourself at home? I can't stay long, the policeman said. I've got a job to do. As you know. Oh, oh, yes, said Walter, such a silly job, a sinecure. He stopped, wondering if the policeman would know what a sinecure was. I, I suppose you know what it's about, uh, the postcards. The policeman nodded. But, but nothing can happen to me as long as you're here, said Walter. I shall be safe, as safe as houses. Stay as long as you can and have a drink. I never drink on duty, said the policeman. Still in his cape and helmet. He looked around. So this is where you work, he said. Yes, I, I was writing when you rang. Some poor devils for it, I expect, the policeman said. Oh, why? Walter was hurt by his unfriendly tone and noticed how hard his gooseberry eyes were. I'll tell you in a minute, said the policeman, and then the telephone bell rang. Walter excused himself and hurried from the room. This uh, is the police station, said a voice. Is that Mr. Streeter? Walter said it was. Well, uh, Mr. Streeter, how is everything at your place? All right, I hope. I'll tell you why I ask. I'm sorry to say we quite forgot about that little job we are going to do for you. Uh, bad coordination, I'm afraid. Uh, but, said Walter, you, you did send someone. No, Mr. Streeter. I'm afraid we didn't. Uh, but there's a policeman here. In this very house. There was a pause. Then his interlocutor said in a less casual voice, He can't be one of our chaps. Uh, did you see his number by any chance? Uh, no. A longer pause and then the voice said, Would you like us to send somebody now? Yes. Please. All right, then. We'll be with you in a jiffy. Walter put back the receiver. What now? He asked himself. Should he barricade the door? Should he run out in the street? Should he try to rouse his housekeeper? A policeman of any sort was a formidable proposition, but a rogue policeman? How long would it take for the real police to arrive? A jiffy, they'd said. What was a jiffy in terms of minutes? While he was debating, the door opened and his guest came in. No room's private when the street doors once passed, he said. Had you forgotten I was a policeman? Was, said Walter, edging away from him. You, you are a policeman. I have been other things as well, the policeman said. Thief, pimp, blackmailer. Not to mention murderer. You should know. The policeman, if such he was, seemed to be moving towards him, and Walter suddenly became alive to the importance of small distances, the distance from the sideboard to the table, the distance from one chair to another. I, I, I don't know what you mean, he said. Why do you speak like that? I, I've never done you any harm. I, I've never set eyes on you before. Oh, haven't you? the man said. But you thought about me. And, his voice rose, and you've written about me. You got some fun out of me, didn't you? Now, I'm going to get some fun out of you. Now. You made me just as nasty as you could. 
Wasn't that doing me harm? You didn't think what it would feel like to be me, did you? You didn't put yourself in my place, did you? You hadn't any pity for me, had you? Well, I'm not going to have any pity for you. But I tell you, cried Walter, clutching the table's edge, I don't know you. And now you say you don't know me. You did all that to me, and then forget me. His voice became a whine, charged with self-pity. You forgot William Stainsforth. William Stainsforth? Yes. I was your scapegoat, wasn't I? You unloaded all your self-dislike on me. You felt pretty good while you were writing about me. You thought, what a noble, upright fellow you were, writing about this rotter. Now, as one W.S. to another, what shall I do if I behave in character? I, I, I don't know, muttered Walter. You don't know, Stainsworth sneered. You ought to know. You fathered me. What would William Stainsworth do if he met his old dad in a quiet place? This kind old dad. Who made him swing. Walter could only stare at him. You know what he'd do as well as I, said Stainsforth. Then his face changed and he said abruptly, No, you don't, because you never really understood me. I'm not so black as you painted me. He paused and a flicker of hope started in Walter's breast. You never gave me a chance, did you? Well, I'm going to give you one. That shows you never understood me, doesn't it? Walter nodded. And there's another thing you've forgotten. What's that? I was a kid once, the ex-policeman said. Walter said nothing. You admit that, said Walter Stainsworth grimly. Well, if you can tell me of one virtue you ever credited me with, just one kind thought, just one redeeming feature. Yes, said Walter, trembling. Well, then I'll let you off. And if I can't, whispered Walter, well then, that's just too bad. We'll have to come to grips. And you know what that means. You took off one of my arms, but I've still got the other. Stainsworth of the iron hand you called me. Walter began to pant. I'll give you two minutes to remember, Stainsworth said. They both looked at the clock. At first, the stealthy movement of the hand paralysed Walter's thought. He stared at William Stainsworth's face, his cruel, crafty face, which seemed to be always in shadow, as if it was something the light could not touch. Desperately, he searched his memory for the one fact that would save him, but his memory, clenched like a fist, would give up nothing. I must invent something, he thought, and suddenly his mind relaxed and he saw, printed on it like a photograph, the last page of the book. Then, with the speed and magic of a dream, each page appeared before him in perfect clarity until the first was reached, and he realised with overwhelming force that what he looked for was not there. In all that evil, there was not one hint of good. And he felt compulsively and with a kind of exultation that unless he testified to this, the cause of goodness everywhere would be betrayed. There's nothing to be said for you, he shouted, and you know it. Of all your dirty tricks, this is the dirtiest. You want me to whitewash you, don't you? The very snowflakes on you are turning black. How dare you ask me for a character? I've given you one already. God forbid I should ever say a good word for you. I'd rather die. Stainsworth's one arm shot out. Then die, he said. 
The police found Walter Streeter slumped across the dining table. His body was still warm, but he was dead. For it was not his hand that his visitor had shaken, but his throat. Walter Streeter had been strangled. Of his assailant, there was no trace. On the table and on his clothes were flakes of melting snow. But how it came there remained a mystery, for no snow was reported from any district on the day he died. So, as you know, it is my habit to say something about the stories. So that was The Go-Between by L.P. Hartley. So Leslie Poles Hartley was born in Cambridgeshire in England in 1895 and died aged 76 in London, England. He was first educated at home and then went to a preparatory school before going to Harrow School, uh, which is a very prestigious private school in the north of London, North London. So it's one of the um, top two or three public schools. And uh, you may not know, but in England, a public school is in fact a private school. So who knows? There'll be some reason for that. And I'm sure somebody will enlighten me as to why that is. But when we talk about public schools, we actually mean private schools and Harrow is one of the best. Despite that, his father was um, relatively middle class rather than upper middle class. He was a solicitor and he owned a brickyard. And of course, to the aristocracy, to be in trade and own brickyards and, and be in commerce was something to be looked down on usually. Um, you were supposed to own land and be descended from the Normans, I think, the Norman conquest. Not that I am, so I'm, I'm speaking about something I don't really know anything about. So he actually ended up at Harrow through a scholarship, the so-called Leaf Scholarship. And after Harrow, where he did very well, he went to Oxford to study modern history. Of course, uh, up at, when he went there, I think it was in, 19, in 1915, before that, um, the only real type of history a, a gentleman would study would be ancient history. It wouldn't be modern history at all. So this was a, a, a terribly... Well, it, I was going to say it was a newfangled thing. I don't actually know when they started teaching modern history at, o at Oxford. So the interest, another interesting thing, uh, sort of a public schools or private schools, at Oxford and Cambridge, you don't study for your degree. You read for it. So um, I don't know if any of you remember University Challenge and people from Oxford uh, and Cambridge would talk about reading history. So, and in fact, they do read history. In fact, that's what that's sort of mainly the degree consists of and then writing stuff about it. So... He went to un University at Oxford, Balliol College, I think, in 1917. He didn't actually volunteer to go into the army, but in, when, that, when conscription came along in 1917, he joined the army and he was commissioned as an officer in the Norfolk Regiment, but he didn't actually see any active service because he had a weak heart. Now, according to the notes, and I don't know the guy, so I don't want to be unfair, but they say he was a hypochondriac. Now, these days, we'd call it a health anxiety, but apparently he was very worried about tetanus and things like that. After the, the war finished, he went back to Oxford to finish his degree, but in fact, he'd already decided he wanted to be a writer, and that was what he wanted to do. And he had some poetry published in Oxford Poetry, and he became an editor of Oxford Outlook. And during his time at Oxford, he became a friend of various writers, uh, including Cynthia Asquith, Lady Cynthia Asquith. And we have um, read one of her stories out on the Classic Ghost Stories podcast, uh, The Corner Shop, which was very well received. And she also edited, she became an editor of Ghost Stories. And his first volume of stories in 1924 was called Night Fears, which was um, Ghost Stories. At Oxford, he became acquainted with... Um, the, the, the aristocracy and he moved in those circles. In 1922 he had a nervous breakdown and went to live in Venice in Italy, uh, not Venice Beach. I've got a story to tell you about that. Uh, once I went to Italy, uh, in Venice, and I bought a ring and it had a dolphin on it, okay, and I had that ring for many years and then I went to Venice Beach in California 
And when I was swimming in the Pacific Ocean, the Pacific Ocean sucked my ring off my finger and when I came out of it, I had no ring. So the, the, the ring came with me from Venice to Venice. Isn't that weird? Anyway, you know what I'm like. You get these anecdotes and these little grasshopper things that come in. So anyway, we're talking about uh, uh, Leslie Poles Hartley. He had moderate success with his novels uh, and he was supported by his friends and very well regarded by um, his contemporaries. He, he mentioned, mentions his influences as Nathaniel Hawthorne. Well, we've done a Nathaniel Hawthorne story on the podcast. I don't think I'll put it up on YouTube yet. Uh, and Edgar Allan Poe and Henry James. So he doesn't write anything like any of those people. I find his prose very pleasant to read, very easy to read, which I can't say for uh, Henry James, wh whose sentences are very convoluted and you fall all over the place. They're very difficult to narrate. Uh, Poe is great to narrate because he's, he's so over the top. Uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne's a, a bit more like Poe, but a bit straightforward, more straightforward anyway. He wrote The Scarlet Letter and things like that, as well as some supernatural stories. In fact, L.P. Hartley's most famous book is The Go-Between, which was made into films and at least once, possibly twice, and famous, you know? And he wrote a great, he wrote many things, but he's, a very memorable quote of his is, which I, I didn't know, he wrote it for a long time, was, the past is another country. They do things differently there. Isn't that magnificent? So he was probably gay, probably. People, it was illegal to be gay, of course, so people didn't come out, but he had a, a, a good, he had male friends, and particularly one good male friend, and he never married a woman. He was a confirmed bachelor. Of course, that doesn't mean anything. And I, had, I remember once uh, making this comment about some other writer, and uh, people saying, you know, just because you don't marry doesn't mean you're gay, and that's absolutely correct. You can not marry for all sorts of reasons, because you don't want to. So people surmise that, and just because um, some of his novels had gay themes, in fact, and people would turn to it together because it was illegal. Anyway, it's just, it's just an observation. It was very difficult to be gay in those days. Okay, so let's talk a bit about the story. It's a really simple, structured story, but very effective. It uses the ticking clock that you find in lots of um, thrillers. So you think of, um, oh, you know, the Poseidon Adventure. You think of any thriller, they have a clock that's ticking down. Something terrible is going to happen when the clock reaches midnight or, you know, and uh, die hard. And it's absolutely, it's in all of them, you know, it's what you do and it's what you ramp suspense up with. And I used to use this, um, you know, you'll hear me saying that I used to write scripts for live role playing games back in the day. Uh, the Call of Cthulhu ones we used to do. And I would use, uh, I would actually time events to happen on the hour. And particularly if we had a clock that struck and people would look and they would get to associate uh, danger with a certain time. And as the time approached, the tension ratcheted up. And this is exactly what this is. is and how he does this is through the postcards. So I, I thought though, if you didn't know anything about um, British geography, you, you might be a bit of a loss because the first one in Forfar up in Angus in northeast Scotland, and then he's at uh, he ends up at York, doesn't he? I can't remember if he's in somewhere else in Scotland as well, Coldstream or somewhere. I can't remember. My uncle used to live in Coldstream, just saying. And um, he comes to York, and then he's at Coventry. I may miss some steps out. And the guy, the author, William Streeter, no Walter Streeter lives in the West Country, so he's getting closer and closer. So if you, if you were familiar with British geography, you'd be like, oh, it's coming closer, closer. So the clock is good. The other thing he does is, which he has to do really, is, is foreshadowing. And one nice little piece of foreshadowing, I may have missed other bits, uh, is um, he's, he keeps promising a hearty handshake. Later on, we find out that he only has one. This man, the policeman, William Stainsforth, only has one arm and his, his hearty handshake is all that one you know so and that is a real good example of the foreshadowing and and the thing that satisfies a reader because you place place a piece of information that isn't you don't draw attention to it it's just there you don't draw attention to it but it is there and then at the end its significance is revealed and the reader goes aha they didn't actually, you didn't flag it up 
so they didn't get it. I mean, people have read so many of these kind of stories that sometimes they can spot. If, if a piece of information is included and there is no obvious reason for it, they might go, oh, what's that about? Of course, Chekhov said this about the gun, didn't he? Place the gun on the mantelpiece. And he also said, don't place it if you're not going to use it as well. I don't know if he said it, because he said it in Russian, and that's paraphrased, but you get the idea. That is the, the idea. And if you do it the other way around, so if you, if you, uh, if you strangled him and then you said something about the handshake, it would not be satisfying. It would be like a, a, a dreaded, perhaps even an info dump. Maybe there isn't enough information in it to be an info dump. But uh, it is, it is um, readers at that point go, they're not happy with that. So you need to put the, if you're going to twist at the end or reveal at the end, it's all about uh, withholding information and revealing it at the end. You've got to reveal it at the right point, not a, you've got to foreshadow, says it all. So this is done really well. The other thing is, of course, we talked, I talked in a previous video about the three situations that you might have. One where the narrator knows more than the reader and with the narrator withholds information. That is a so-called unreliable uh, narrator. Yeah. Roger Ackroyd, the murder of, as somebody pointed out, that Agatha Christie's famous um, unreliable narrator. And uh, then, so that's, so the narrator knows more and withholds information from the reader. The other way around is the reader may know more than the, and this often happens, think of Dan Brown's books, the reader may know more than the character. The character is walking into a situation that we already know has been set up for us. It's going to be very dangerous for them, but they don't, you know, and that is suspense. And then it, you may have a situation where we're actually both in the dark. And that's something like Lost. I, wa I watched that, uh, that recent film by M. Night Shyam when we were up in Edinburgh um, called Older. Old? Yeah. Mm, I, I wish I hadn't gone to see it actually. Suicide Squad was on and my daughters, one of them was like, we're going to see old and the other was we're going to see Suicide Squad. And I think we thought we were being more intellectual but I possibly would have enjoyed Suicide Squad better anyway. So there we are. So in this case, um, we go towards the end. I suppose this is a writer's story in lots of ways because we will all have been accused of creating two-dimensional characters and this is what the character who comes alive blames the author and there's something Frankensteinian in that of course in that um, of course Frankenstein, Dr Frankenstein creates the monster who basically then hates him because he hasn't been a very good dad and in a sense that's what WS the police, one-handed policeman is accusing WS the author of not being a very good dad, kind of creating him and not giving him the benefit of the doubt, not giving him a break, not letting him show any goodness and damning him completely. So yes, something, what did uh, Frankenstein, Mary uh, Shelley call it, the, the, the modern pr Prometheus. So yeah, so I think that's what that's about. It's an effective story. It is very simple and it clicks down towards the end and we get that mounting tension and then the thing's revealed. Oh yeah, the only thing I would say about the foreshadowing is we are told that the WS character was a policeman but not until he's been a policeman. So it might have been better if there had been some hint at the beginning that there was a red herring, wasn't there, saying, oh, it's a woman. That was just to throw us off. I, I wasn't massively convinced by that. But if at that point we'd had some, some information that would have made us link the character to being a police officer, then later on at the end we would have gone, aha, when the policeman, it would have dawned on us. Although it may well have dawned on us. And, and I suppose that is a fourth case. So we've got... Narrator withholds information. We, we may have information that the character doesn't have, number two, and, or we might be both in the dark. But there's a fourth one where the, the, the writer, the author, does not give us the information, but we guess it. 
because of our cultural familiarity with this type of story. So when the policeman appears, some of you will have been saying, I know what's going on here. That is not the author who's done that for you. You have guessed that because of your familiarity with this kind of story. But going back to the point, if we'd been had some hint early on that, that there was some link with the police, we would have had a bigger aha moment, I think. I think the reason that L.S. Hartley didn't do it, L.P. Hartley, all these initials, didn't do it, is because it possibly would have collapsed the story. We would have just guessed too much. It would have become too obvious. And I think probably he couldn't have done that, although it would have created a bigger aha, because if he'd given too much information, it would have just become plain what was happening and, and we would have lost the suspense. So, yeah, I think it was a good story. It was recommended by a reader, a listener, a listener, reader, viewer, wh whoever they are. It was recommended as a story. It's a story I, I, I knew, and it was nice and short, which I like. I welcome stories from recommended, that I, particularly ones I haven't read, and I've, I get loads of those, actually. The only issue is that some people recommend stories that are novel length, and they're just, they're just too long, because a novel... You know, something like 90,000 words, it, it takes, that's something like, if we you reckon a thousand words is 10 minutes, so that's 90,000 minutes, which is divided by 60, is like 15 hours? If that was correct, my math is better than I thought. But uh, yeah, 15 hours, it's just too long. It's too long. And also, they're often a copyright, so you might say, oh, do a Stephen King, or Ramsey Campbell. People often recommend Ramsey Campbell. Well, Ramsey Campbell is, is very famous for hunting down breaches of copyright and destroying them, and they don't want to be destroyed. So there we are, that's the story. This is the first one I've done fully as a video. I hope that the camera works, I hope everything works, and the sound's okay, and I've managed to remember to plug the microphone in, and all of those things. Otherwise, things are going well. I hope you're all well. Summer is coming into autumn where we are, the swallows are sitting on the lines and having a chat, the chatter, the chitter chatter, and they think about leaving. Yeah, but the autumn is good for us, uh, the season of mists and mellow fruitfulness, but the gathering gloom, pumpkin lanterns. Uh, I used to love the autumn as a boy. We had conker season, which I'm not going to go into, but, but well, okay. Yeah, horse chestnuts, the, 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 the nuts come down, you break them open, you put them on a piece of string and you, you bash them against other boys or girls who have theirs on the string. We had all sorts of techniques, we used to varnish them, we used to put shellac on them. Some people used to make false conkers of plaster and in order to get, to get up in the conker league. Yep, so that was, that was one thing that happened and then it was Halloween and then it was bonfire night and then it was Christmas. Uh, so it was all pretty cool this time of year. Anyway, I could digress forever, uh, but then I'd never get this edited. So anyway, I hope you're all well. Um, peace and love. Okay, I will be back soon. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come back. Don't they? Isn't that so? Everybody come back. Don't they? Isn't that so? Everybody come back. Isn't that so? Isn't that so?